So we're very fortunate to have Fran Berman with us today. Um, she's the Edward Hamilton Distinguished Professor in Computer Science at Rensselaer Polytechnic, or RPI. She's a fellow of the Association for Computing Machinery, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In 2009, she was the inaugural recipient of the ACM IEEE Ken Kennedy Award for influential leadership in the design, development, and deployment of national scale cyber infrastructure. In 2015, she was nominated by President Obama and confirmed by the US Senate to serve on the National Council on the Humanities. She's the lead of the Research Data Alliance, a community-driven international organization created to accelerate research data sharing worldwide. Some other things as well. <laughs> For her accomplishments, leadership, and vision, Professor Berman was recognized by the US Library of Congress as a digital preservation pioneer, as one of the top women in technology by Business Week and Newsweek, and as one of the top technologists by IEEE Spectrum. The only thing she doesn't say in her CV is that she's a good friend of mine, and I'm really happy that she's come to speak to us. So, Fran, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, David and I go back a long time, and uh, it's always really great to see him. But this is the first time I've gotten to see David in his home environment. So, and it's my first trip to Australia, and I've just had a blast. So. I'm currently planning how I'm going to get myself back here, so um, thanks very much for hosting me. Um, it's, really, it's really fun and a pleasure to talk to you all, and in fact, um, one of the reasons for this trip, in addition to this talk, was to be in Melbourne uh, at the beginning of the week and um, to work with the folks at ANS on Research Data Alliance, so I'll be talking a little bit about that as well. Um, today I wanted to just do kind of an overview talk, and an overview about um, the ecosystem we need for data-driven research, which is, um, I think, an area that's of great interest to um, all of us in every sector, because if you think about it, we're in the information age, it's a data-driven world, and understanding what to do with that data, how to do that with that data, and how to provide the right kind of foundation and ecosystem for that data is really important, and uh, all of you, and I think, um, colleagues of all of ours are really at the forefront of that. So um, let's start, and um, uh, I'm not the tallest person, so can everybody see me okay over all the uh, equipment? Okay, good. Fortunately, this is not one of those things where the, you know, the DS comes to here and I'm a talking forehead, so this is a good thing. Um, so, so let's just start with the why are we doing this? And um, I think that's just a really, uh, you know, really, you know, whenever you're doing something, you know, why are you doing that? Why is that important? And I think um, there's an easy answer, which is data is driving virtually everything these days. If you have a public health question about, uh, you know, where is asthma more prevalent across the world or any kind of disease, if you have a question in agriculture where you're trying to think about, you know, how can we increase wheat yields, how, what kind of evidence can we bring to make good decisions about that, if you think about sustaining the environment and the various natural resources that we have, if you're wondering about how accurate the standard model of physics is, and uh, you're a high energy physicist and you spend a lot of time with your colleagues in Geneva at CERN, um, all of these things are data driven. And data is being used in very wa various ways to help us make good predictions, to you know, model well and accurately, to um, get answers to questions that are interesting to us no matter what sector we're in. Now, um, for those of us that work in the data world, you know, this is a great first slide and, and, or an okay first slide, and, you know, you go from there and you talk about particular questions and, you know, how you might go about analyzing the data to get the answers and, you know, how useful those answers are. But um, for many of us, we're worried about how you serve up the data and make it useful in the first place. And one of the things that I think many people in all of our communities know is that making the data available just isn't good enough. And so you actually need infrastructure, you know, boring old infrastructure um, to support data-driven research and innovation. Because the data isn't an asset if you don't know what it means. And it's not useful if you can't find it. And it's not, it's not, you can't analyze it and use it with other people's data collections, et cetera, if it's not in the right form. And these days with, um, I think, a worldwide interest in reproducibility and taking results that we've done before and then comparing them with other results, um, 
you know, if we don't have it, if we haven't uh, saved it, if we haven't been good stewards and we haven't preserved it, then we can't reproduce from it because it's gone. And so the infrastructure part of that is tremendously important. Our goal is innovation, but really the enabler is infrastructure and the infrastructure has to be there. So, you know, uh, you know, at the base of it all is that, you know, the data has to persist. This is my California roots, my apologies to you all. Um, uh, but the data has to persi persist. So at the end of the day, you know, the data needs to be available. It needs to be living in some sort of structure. And somebody's got to pay the mortgage for the house that the data lives in. Because homeless data will, will cease to exist. So um, we can start with innovation, which can make the headlines of the science sections of our um, periodicals. The infrastructure almost never does unless we lose something. Um, but the sustainable data infrastructure is incredibly important um, for us to be able to use, find, um, have the best use of that data. So, you know, one of the things I'd like to talk about today is, you know, how do we create this sustainable ecosystem for data? And it turns out that um, not only do we have a lot of data professionals who have experience in this, but we have experience throughout sectors and throughout the world in sustainable development period. You know, we think about our own Earth global ecosystem and the, all the kinds of resources that are important to us. And there's been a lot of work in that area to figure out how do you create a global Earth physical ecosystem. And so when you think about sustainable development, the Brundtland Commission, which was a UN commission that um, looked at this, you know, a number of years ago, said, well, you need, air, you need uh, key areas. Um, you know, key uh, um, components in four different areas, um, ecology, economics, culture, and politics. So you need all four of those to be helping you sustain the ecosystem. And so a fun thought exercise for all of us is to say, well, what if we apply this to a sustainable digital environment? You know, what kinds of ecology and eco eco economics and politics and culture do we need? And so I thought I would sort of do a riff on that today. And to think about in each of these four areas, four challenges that we need, they're not everything, but four challenges that we need to address now to be able to develop this sustainable ecosystem. Why do we want to develop it? We want to provide the infrastructure for data. Why do we need data? Because data is driving innovation. So it turns out that this is a really uh, fundamental thing. So I'm going to go through each four of these, pick out a question, tell you about some work, um, and, and then end up at the end of the hour. So let's start with ecology. And you can kind of think of the ecology of the data ecosystem as the infrastructure, right? So um, the question is, you know, how do we develop, uh, accelerate the development of data infrastructure? Data infrastructure is happening everywhere. It's happening in our university projects, on our universities, um, in the private sector, in the public sector. How do we um, uh, accelerate that? And um, the first question you might ask is, well, what kind of infrastructure do we need? So if I want to ask these questions about innovation, who's at risk for asthma, or how do we increase agricultural uh, productivity, et cetera, you know, what are my infrastructure building blocks? And it turns out that there's loads of them. And, and uh, I'm sure that you're all familiar with them as well. Um, it's useful for communities to have, you know, common metadata standards. That helps us understand what we're looking at. It's useful to have data sharing policies, which is a kind of social infrastructure, which helps us understand what our responsibilities to the group are. It's great to have data analysis algorithms, which helps us predict things, et cetera. So all of these building blocks and more are really important pieces of infrastructure um, for us to be able to um, serve up that data and use it to ask questions um, about, about uh, the things that we're interested in. Now, um, one of the things that I wanted to point out is um, the kind of infrastructure we need is not just technical. We need technical infrastructure, but we also need what I think of as social infrastructure. So, um, for example, you know, here I come to Australia uh, from uh, New York. Uh, I'm, I'm from California originally, but I live in New York now. Um, and uh, what I want to do is get to the hotel and sleep. Okay, after I sleep, I want to read my email, right? And, you know, so do I need to wait for the U.S. and Australia to adopt, you know, the same kind of uh, conventions around what kind of plug, what shape, size, color, 
um, you know, power systems. Um, I really don't have to do that. I have um, my handy dandy um, adapter. Uh, you know, I looked on the internet before I came, you know, what kind of plugs do they have in Australia? Um, I got an adapter that helps me uh, read my email and, you know, good to go. And that happens if I go to France or Tokyo or, you know, any other place. And so, you know, in some sense, it's not so important that we come up with the universal system as it is that whatever systems we come up with, because coming up with the universal system is a long-term uh, proposition, if it's a proposition at all, we come up with the ways that have a low barrier to access for interoperating between systems. Okay, so systems interoperability, important. Common metadata standards. Some communities are ready for that and some aren't, but if I'm trying to build something and I go to my local lumber store, they don't just give me the size of lumber, or the size of screw or whatever um, that they feel like making that day. The, the construction industry has come together you know, made some um, agreements about what a common size for lumber and screws and, you know, various things are. And then I might have to do some custom stuff and do a last mile problem, but at least I can put things together based on some community agreements. So community agreements matter. Um, policy is an incredibly important tool. Um, in the U.S., when the National Institutes of Health said, if you do a certain kind of research, uh, we want you, you know, with proteins, we want you to ingest your data into the protein data bank, and they did this decades ago. And what that meant is now that there's a very useful community data collection that's used worldwide um, by the entire community, and it means it sort of raises the level of the, uh, the ocean for everyone because now we all have access to that in a, in a very common way. So policy, when someone says it's really important for you to share your data in a particular way, that makes a difference. Uh, economics, you know, uh, we took a ferry over there. If somebody doesn't pay the ferry bill, you know, it doesn't show up, not good. Uh, you know, training and education. If you don't know how to turn on your computer, your computer is not useful for you. Um, and adopted community practice because, you know, there are many instances where rules don't apply to everything. You know, if you're driving, your motor vehicle code is not covering every situation that you come in. So there's sort of a, a fairly sophisticated internal model that you have about when the rules apply and when you have to do something that the community's roughly agreed on, on who gets to go first. And that minimizes um, our, our opportunity for, you know, getting in a collision, which is not a good opportunity. Um, so, so, you know, this is how we operate in the real world. And we use both technical and social infrastructure to facilitate the things we want to do. And it's how we need to operate and how we do operate in the data world. So, you know, this kind of recognition uh, really was the underlying motivator uh, uh, for uh, an organization that myself and others are, are involved in called the Research Data Alliance. And roughly around 2011, 2012, um, uh, research uh, agencies from around the world who meet in a variety of uh, different venues were talking about what they could do to enable and empower and facilitate the community to actually build some of the infrastructure necessary for many of their projects and activities. And, you know, as those of you who are researchers know, we aren't the biggest possible market. So all of the things that we need for our projects aren't necessarily available commercially, and we oftentimes sort of build them ourselves in our own labs to do the kinds of things we want. Um, the Research Data Alliance was um, developed to help people build the kinds of infrastructure they need to answer research questions, and typically in the open access space. Um, it started in August of 2012. Eight people were on the phone, including two Australians and two Americans. I was one of the Americans. And, uh, and uh, Andrew Trelaw and Ross Wilkinson from ANS were the two Australians on the phone. Um, and then uh, by this year, you know, scarcely about uh, three and a bit years later, um, it, we have 4,000 uh, plus members from 110 different countries. So it really took off, and it took off in an unprecedented way, and it's because people feel the need to um, uh, build infrastructure, but typically in our reward systems, if you're at a university, you may not get um, recognition for doing that in the same way you get recognition for a research publication. And getting the input from people in different domains and people from all around the world helps you build better infrastructure. 
And if the better infrastructure can address your problems better, then you can really sort of move ahead. So the idea with the RDA is to build that kind of infrastructure, provide a vehicle for doing that for people who chose that. And I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, of that. And, and sort of ultimately to accelerate the building of infrastructure for particular purposes and the building of global infrastructure for research data. So the RDA approach is very pragmatic. This is not an organization that's doing decadal surveys. This is an organization that's fun fo focused on building infrastructure. There's two kinds of group in the RDA. Most of the 4,000 members are in one or more of these. Uh, there's working groups who actually build infrastructure. They have an idea of what they want to build. Um, they have an idea what problems it solves. And the people who will use the infrastructure are in the working group. So adopters are, are, are part of the working group. And then we have interest groups of uh, people in particular areas. They might be looking at marine data and how to harmonize various kinds of things, or um, they might be in repositories and thinking about best practice or a variety of other things. I'll tell you about them in a little bit. Um, and they're a longer-lived kind of group. And once they figure out what they want to build, they might uh, then sort of spit off a, a working group or a one or more working groups to try to build that. Um, the RDA culture is really pragmatic. Uh, you, you don't get to, you know, build anything in the context of a working group unless somebody is going to adopt it. Um, the idea is not to sort of create the universal everything, but to, uh, to create something that solves somebody's problem, but it doesn't have to be everybody's problem. Um, to, uh, to not be a forum for particular people to say, uh, God, I keep getting this, um, use my stuff. Right? It's an idea to create things that solve specific problems, and then if other things create uh, solve other problems or the same problem, that's okay. Um, not big on world domination. Um, all of us are in organizations. We want to be the sort of best organization in the world. The idea is to partner with lots of other data organizations and institutions um, to work on this. And then to amplify the impact of the things that are built within the RDA so other people can use them and make them available via GitHub or, you know, other kinds of um, uh, venues. You might be thinking, okay, well, what are those folks doing? Um, the organization doesn't tell anyone what to build. It, it, really, um, it really serves as an accelerator, as a vehicle for people who want to build things. And we found that among the 4,000 members, um, you can kind of think of them in this um, handy-dandy uh, um, quadrant, which is we have sort of beneficiaries and solutions um, and, and we have things sort of all over the place, from technical solutions aimed at, aimed at data providers to social solutions aimed at beneficiaries. So here, this gives you kind of a sense. Among the interest groups, um, the folks that have developed interest groups, the data consumer, it might be folks in structural biology who are looking at particular kinds of technical solutions for metadata, et cetera. Um, on the social and data provider side, it might be people who are looking at um, best practices and data cost recoveries for various repositories or centers, um, et cetera. And so all of those are groups that are, and, and there's more, there's right now about 70 different groups in the RDA, including both working groups and interest groups. Roughly three-fourths, um, I think I have that right, um, are interest groups in the other quarter, or say working groups. Um, and so all of these are folks who have just sort of found the RDA as a, a really useful place for them, for, uh, them to do work that they would do as part of their day job and uh, things that they're interested in. Um, working groups, we have people who are building infrastructure in lots of different areas. Um, I'll tell you about three of them on the next slide, but you can see they're sort of all across the board. And um, really it's, it's people who want to build infrastructure, who are building infrastructure. They're really happy to have a broader group of people, both in terms of people outside their domain to vet it, uh, people outside their country, um, people of different ages. RDA really believes in sort of um, creating the whole uh, generational pipeline because the people who are sort of just entering the data field now are people who are going to be leading the data field in another decade or two. And so ha having this kind of worldwide network is really useful for them. And so, um, and so the idea is to really bring all of those people in on your group. I'll just give you, for the fun of it, um, three different infrastructure outputs from the RDA groups and um, in sort of across the board. Um, so the first one I, I thought I'd talk about is something that's aimed at the data consumer 
and you can kind of think of this as social infrastructure. And if you read a paper, right, and somebody points to a data collection, and now you want to, you know, you say, gee, this is really interesting, it's relevant to my work, I would like to reproduce their results or combine their data with my data. Well, perhaps they're using a data collection that's evolving over time. People are adding to it or uh, people are correcting it in different ways or something like that. So what you really want to do is you want to timestamp that data collection for precisely the time you publish the paper. And what these folks in the Dynamic Data Citation Working Group did is they have a number of recommendations that you incorporate um, within your framework, within your setup, so you can timestamp the data collection so you know precisely what the data collection looked like when they wrote the paper. This is not exciting stuff, right? It's just practical stuff that enables you to do better science. It's not, you know, front page of the, uh, you know, science magazine. But without this, um, it's really hard to do reproducibility well. And these guys um, came up with something that um, was vetted in the literature, their approach, and then they used RDA to actually build the infrastructure. And they got a number of people, including um, these folks who are adopting it. And in fact, in the US, um, we just put a call out for people who wanted to adopt things. And we have um, this being used by people looking at Vermont forests and um, Woods Hole uh, Oceanographic Institute and people across domains find it very useful. Um, the second type of thing is kind of an under, under the covers things that many of you will recognize. Um, what type your data is is really important. It's important to you and it's important to the machines that have to deal with the data. Um, so there was a group that uh, came up with um, a nice model for data type registries. And, um, and then they uh, built the infrastructure, some prototypes and provided it to um, the community. Um, our National Institute for Standards and Technology is using that, the materials group there, and a number of people around the world are using that because um, having some way of uh, uh, registry for your data types is very, very useful. And then finally, in the um, domain area, I thought you'd be interested in this. This is a really cool um, working group. Um, the wheat data folks are folks from all around the world, and they want to answer questions like, you know, what's the best strain of wheat to plant in this particular location? So, you know, how would you answer that question? Well, you want to know um, what kinds of diseases the, the wheat might get, germplasm data. You might want to know um, things about rainfall. You might want to know things about, um, you know, soil uh, composition. You might want to know population, right? So you want to combine all these different data collections. Um, and you want to do that in an interoperable way. So they came up with an interoperability framework in which, in which you can combine questions like this. They're making it available for people. And now um, it's being adopted by um, uh, folks dealing with um, agricultural productivity in the UN and elsewhere. But now they're actually kind of um, adopting it to rice and maize and you know, other kinds of crops for which this kind of framework would be useful. So this gives you a sense that um, that infrastructure is critical to answer, you know, the really exciting sort of domain questions, but somebody's got to build the infrastructure, and this gives people all around the world a vehicle to sort of work together to build it and to get a little recognition for it. Typically, you don't get much recognition for building infrastructure. Okay, um, just telling you a couple of slides on the RDA community. Um, this group comes together on a pretty regular basis, twice a year. Um, uh, we try to uh, be sensitive to the fact that our members live all around the world and so um, each place that we go is probably inconvenient for like 98% of the people to get to, um, but we try to uh, uh, move that around. Um, Australia actually hosted, uh, co-hosted the plenary in Ireland. That probably wasn't good for you guys, but uh, that meant that we did have some Australian uh, hosting. We, we host about one out of every three or four plenaries in the U.S. So um, our first one, uh, Plenary 2, is in Washington, D.C. Plenary 5 is in San Diego. And then uh, Plenary 8, which is in September, which is part of International Data Week. So it's going to be really exciting. We're partnering with CoData and um, WDS, and that will be in Denver. So um, please come if you can. Um, the other thing that's been really interesting about RDA plenaries, besides being a really good community building and gathering, and they're all working meetings, so we spend 60% of our time with people running around through various groups trying to um, get together face-to-face -to -face and 
uh, in ways that they can't uh, most of the rest of the year. But we're also uh, sort of a great venue for people to do co-located meetings. And we've had people, you know, in, in the biosciences and storage and the World Bank and climate data co-locating their meetings with RDA meetings because it's useful for these communities to mix. And a lot of um, really good sort of cross-fertilization happens. Um, I just thought you might want to know uh, what's the RDA stuff in Australia. Um, our, the RDA regions are active because there are regional issues that uh, everybody wants to deal with and it's good to get to know the people in your own country. Um, there's sort of a push-pull. The idea is to bring re uh, uh, issues of importance to the data community in Australia or the US or Europe into RDA and to pull out you know, infrastructure and kinds of things we can bring to enhance your competitiveness and your leadership in everybody's country. And um, I just thought you'd be really interested in uh, RDA in Australia and RDA in the US in particular. Um, RDA in Australia is really, uh, the Australians have really been sort of founding members of RDA. Um, the ANS folks have shown a huge amount of leadership and they're doing um, a lot of stuff here and maybe you, you all can tell me about it. Uh, uh, as well um, in terms of infrastructure coordination development and plenary hosting and um, global support. Um, in the U.S., we've done the organizational stuff and we have a number of programs including student programs and adoption amplification which means that we help people embed the RDA infrastructure in their own environments uh, to improve it, different coordination uh, workshops with Europe, etc. So basically that gives you a sense about, uh, and we're not the only community organization for sure, but what people are doing to, do, to accelerate infrastructure. And of course in the you know, public sector, academic uh, sector, private sector, among them, in the academic sector of course we're sort of the smallest market and we have the kind of least strong value proposition. And so that makes it hard to sort of build and sustain infrastructure. Uh, in the public sector, you have to. It's a legacy for your, uh, your uh, national legacy. In the private sector, you want to because it's your competitive advantage. Your data is your competitive advantage. The academic sector, uh, we're often challenged. And so this brings us to the next question, which is, you know, who pays the data bill? And especially for us in the academic sector, how can we get this um, happening? And in fact, um, you know, for many of this, this is the Achilles heel of the information age. When that information goes away, it's gone, right? Uh, you can't get it back. And so, you know, somebody's got to pay the, the lights, power, and um, other kinds of bills um, required to keep it going. So you might say, well, what's the big deal? Um, you know, I keep my data on my laptop, you know, that's good enough. I serve it up to my um, colleagues, you know, etc. So you can think of that as your locally manageable data. Data that you keep on your laptop um, or your local environment, you can do it for free. If your hard drive crashes, you know, uh, not good, but nobody dies, um, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So that's, that's pretty cheap uh, data for us to uh, keep around. But much of the data we want to deal with um, is more expensive to us. Why is it more expensive? Well, maybe it's big data, right? If I'm an astrophysicist and I've done a simulation of the universe since the Big Bang, and I've got 300 terabytes of data, I'm not putting that on my laptop, right? I want to keep it around until I do my next simulation. Um, if I need to keep my data for 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 years, I have to figure out, you know, how am I going to migrate it forward every time I change my media? And, you know, somebody's got to do it, somebody's got to pay for new media, somebody's got to uh, make sure it's safe. Um, if access control is, either very broad or very limited. Somebody's got to put the systems in place. Um, when uh, I was at the, I directed the San Diego Supercomputer Center for nine years when we were there, we had a copy of the Protein Data Bank. Um, one of the things that we needed to do is was serve it up to the whole world all the time. And so it actually forced us to make our networking and our, um, our facilities stronger to be able to provide the kind of reliability that the PDB folks needed. Um, if, if my uh, data is HIPAA compliant, if there's some special privacy concerns about who can look at it, again, that's more infrastructure. You don't want to make sure that um, people who don't 
uh, need to see it are seeing it. So, you know, that's more expensive. Um, if they're data services, if I want to mosaic my astronomy data so I can uh, use it with everyone else, if there's more curation required, um, if there's more management or stewardship. So, you know, data gets expensive um, when the infrastructure becomes more expensive. And it isn't all stuff that we can, you know, stick on our hard drive or our iPhone or whatever and, and uh, uh, handle. And this just gives you an, uh, an example of sort of what we ran into when we were at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, which is, you know, you think about the cost. Well, you might say, well, storage is going down. You know, what's the big deal? You know, storage is going down, but you have to still pay for power and cooling and people, training, documentation, monitoring, costs of uh, compliance with regulation, et cetera. And those things are not... Uh, are not going down, and even if they are, there's a lot of them. Um, this shows you our growth. Um, uh, on my watch, David knows this well. We tried to put together, Natasha Bollock was leading this um, uh, facility um, to host a data repository for sci scientists uh, called Data Central. We did that for free, which turns out to be a fatal uh, flaw in this. Um, but we had about 100 different data collections. We had several petabytes worth of data because we made, um, we made different uh, copies of data as, as one does. And um, so the blue line, sorry about the tiny font, but the blue line is basically kind of the demand. And so, you know, the magenta line is fitted to that. And then the red stair step is us trying to keep ahead of buying storage. And so, you know, the, the, you know, the gift that keeps on giving, and it's, it can get very expensive if you don't have a realistic date, uh, business model. So business models matter. They might not be interesting, but they matter. Okay, so um, at the U.S., we've had a big discussion on open data. I expect this is the same discussion that people are having all around the world. And, um, you know, as I talk to my friends and colleagues um, in the Research Data Alliance and internationally, um, open data is a big deal. Um, you know, let's make that data available. In the U.S., we actually got a memo from the Office of Science and Technology Policy. That was the U.S. Science Advisor, John Holdren, um, and it called for new policies for federal agencies um, to host and make available research data and publications. There's a publications part, you know, has to be available, which, you know, as you can imagine, um, really uh, has been a big topic with the um, publisher community. And then there was a research data component. Got to make that data available too. Um, of course, there was no new money associated with doing this. So as we all know, infrastructure doesn't come for free, so how do you do this? And of course, as the New York Times pithily put it, hey, we paid for the research, so let's see it. Um, as we all know, um, that's a lovely thing to say, but there's a lot of devil uh, in the details behind that, those kinds of infrastructure requirements. So um, at that time, I was thinking a lot about this, as was, you know, everyone else. And um, so Vint Cerf and I wrote a, um, an op-ed in, um, in science to try to influence the discussion to at least elevate the notion of business model to um, a first-class priority. Because really, if you, don't, if you can't pay for the infrastructure, it's hard to really sustain the data. And um, so we wrote uh, an article in Science in August 2013 um, uh, about who will pay for public access. I'll tell you the solution that we suggested on the next slide. But the funny thing about this was, um, you know, it provoked discussions as we had uh, hoped. Um, some of the discussions were, uh, we got several irony awards because science charged you to read the article. So uh, if you're interested in this article, and the free copy is on my website, science usually gives the author of the article a free copy and they can put it up. So this is a good thing for you to know. So anyway, the free copy is there. Okay, so here's what we suggested. Um, we suggested that no one sector is going to do it all. Um, it's just not realistic to think the government's going to do it or the, pub, you know, or the, the university's going to do it. It's really a shared responsibility. And what we suggested was um, that each sector has something to, to do. So in the academic sector, and um, I, I just had a great conversation this morning um, and this week about, you know, what you all are doing, which is... Um, I think um, uh, really terrific uh, in that evolution, which is um, universities in some sense need to step up 
and start thinking about what it's going to do with, uh, and governments as well, what it's going to do with respect to research data. How can we start creating some sort of plan to protect and, and steward and sustain the research data that means a lot to us? In the U.S., we have a lot of different research agencies. We have the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, Department of Energy, um, you know, a bunch of different things. And, um, and they all have a slightly different approach to these things. Um, for us, it's really useful to get some clarity. So our, our, um, our suggestion was we need to know sort of what uh, research agencies are going to think of as stuff they're willing to sustain. Protein Data Bank has a business model that involves research agencies and what they're not. And the ones they're not, you can create a market around because you know that government's not going to pick that up. But if, uh, but if you think the government's going to pick up everything, there's a lot of confusion. So our suggestions to the government was to really get really clear about what you're going to pick up, what you're not, how much you're going to spend on infrastructure, how much you're not which, as you know, is a really difficult thing. Our, our uh, suggestion for the private sector is the private sector does things in the common good all the time, right? If you go to the ballet or the theater, you often see private sector companies having sponsored it, right? There's no reason they can't sponsor research data for the community under the right set of rules. You know, everybody uh, is available. Uh, it's available to everybody. They can't pick your data pocket. They can't just throw it out when they decide it's not a good thing to do anymore. But those are kind of contractual arrangements you can have with the private sector. And they can catch some of this research data. They shouldn't catch it all, but they can catch some of it. So it's their responsibility as well. And then uh, maybe the most um, controversial suggestion we had is that individuals can pay for this too. And, um, you know, I know I read the New York Times and, you know, download music on my iPhone. I'm willing to pay a low barrier of access fee that goes into you know, infrastructure and, you know, these companies, et cetera. Um, but I, I don't pay anything for the protein data bank or the Arabidopsis resource or census data in the U.S., et cetera. So, um, uh, so there are things that we could do. Perhaps I could put that in my grant or my institution could pay for things. Um, there are things that we can do to really help um, beef up some of this infrastructure. Um, sustainability matters. Um, you've got to come up with some sort of um, business model, and, and, and our suggestions were that there were other things you can do everywhere. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so that, uh, you know, the, the, the real story on economics, which is that you don't have to do any one of those things, but you have to do something. You don't get to, you know, do the free rider hot potato problem, which is just assume someone else is going to do it. That, that's not going to work. Um, uh, so let's talk about culture. And I wanted to sort of, um, uh, we'll talk a little bit, uh, uh, the things in the lower uh, hemisphere of uh, um, this, uh, uh, this globe are a little bit more in process. But um, I, I wanted to talk about how we determine where stewardship and preservation infrastructure is, is needed most. So we know we have to build it. We have various ways of doing that. We know we have to pay for it. But we can't do everything, so which things should we do? And um, this is a question that my colleague Myron and Gutman and I from, uh, he's from the University of Colorado, wanted to look at is sort of what's the state of the art? Because when you talk to a stakeholder, i.e. someone with resources who can help you do these things, um, they, want, they want to know, what, you know what's the state of the art and where can I most fruitfully invest to help solve the problem? And so it's nice to have some well-evidenced answers for those kinds of questions. So, um, so, you know, one question you can ask is, well, you know, is there a problem at all? Did you just make this up? And, um, and so one thing that um, some folks from the Office of Science and Technology Policy who are affiliated with the National Institute of Health decided to do is look at that for a very circumscribed um, uh, part of the data universe, which is, um, all the data associated with 2011 PubMed, all the different medical uh, publications. Um, uh, let's look at the data for them and figure out how, many, how much of it is, is taken care of, right? So that's arguably a, bu a big bucket of valuable data. How much of it is well stewarded? And um, what they did in their study, it's a really interesting uh, paper from PLOS One, is they found that only 12% 
only 12%, this is like amazing, uh, of the publication data um, is in a known good repository. And 88% is invisible, which means we don't know. So that's over 200,000 different data sets, right? And among those 200,000 different data sets, um, a small percentage of data re uh, reflect data reuse. Maybe more, more interesting to me is that over 50% of those data sets were from live uh, subjects. And that's really hard data to reproduce, right? So if you lose it, you know, uh, how are you going to really start looking at those kinds of, um, those kinds of results? So because we really don't know much about this 88%, that makes it hard to figure out where to invest. You know, say somebody, you go to someone and say, you know, give me a thimble of money to invest in data stewardship. You know, what do you do with that money? And, and where is it best spent? So um, it turns out that, you know, we, we talk about sort of valued data, right? So, uh, so, so here's some sort of uh, results in progress. Um, first of all, there's a lot of kinds of value, right? There's not just one kind of value. So um, as a society, we value data that, you know, we keep our presidential emails in the United States and the National Archives, everything Obama does on his uh, little device we have to keep. Uh, we have to keep business data by law. Um, we have to, you know, emails of various private sectors. There's things like the Shoah collection of Holocaust survivor testimony, um, that's not reproducible, obviously, very important. So as a society, these things are really important. Um, personally, we've kind of, you know, do what we can for ourselves. So, you know, I know I should pay for my tax data. Um, I, you know, uh, I have my kids, grad those are actually my kids, uh, my kids' graduation pictures. I want to keep digital versions of those. I don't want them to go away. And so I take care of that. I take responsibility for that. Not all of those are my kids, by the way. Um, two of them are. And then as a research community, we have um, various kinds of uh, data. So uh, things that are of value. We think that things are valuable if somebody makes us keep it. Uh, we think things are of value if it's from something that's, say, highly cited, right? We think uh, data is, is valuable if it's part of a collection that accrues over time. The panel study of incomes dynamics is a... Uh, um, uh, social science data collection. It's been around for decades and decades. It, you know, looks at people's uh, uh, lives and the economic influence and, you know, nature versus nurture kind of questions over time. So there's a bunch of data that we think of as valuable, but it's not all the same kind of value. And we might take different strategies to keep these different kinds of value. The other thing we found out on this, uh, on our little pilot study, is there's a bunch of different kinds of gaps. Um, you know, not all of them are money. Uh, some of them are insufficient staff, right, to do the things that need to be done. Some of them are lack of facilities. Some of them are lack of people who think it's their responsibility to do it. Or sort of um, the culture clash between a research community, a library community, a stakeholder community, an IT community, etc. cetera. Um, some of it is because we don't have the tools we need uh, or our tools are insufficient. Uh, some of it is because we don't have the policies we need, and those need to be developed. And so um, it's not all the same kind of gap, and it's not all money. And so this sort of gives you a way to start getting at this, like, huge problem, which is um, on another study I, I um, was privileged enough to be part of, the Blue Ribbon Task Force for Sustainable Digital Preservation and Access, we had people testify to us that say, well, we haven't had a problem yet, so what we're doing is probably good enough, right? Or, uh, or this is such a big problem, um, you know, it's just too big and too hard, so I'm just going to pretend it's not there. Well, I think we've all heard stuff like that, but the fact is you have to start somewhere, and, and you have to start in some manageable way. You can't solve the whole problem for everyone. So one of the things we're trying to do is to try to figure out, if you think about all the different types of value and all the different gaps, there are strategies. And now when we start thinking about what's the particular problem in my facility, at my university, in my project, you can start getting at what are the strategies I can use. Um, is it a training issue? Is it a money issue? Is it a facilities issue, et cetera? And, that, and that's a really important and pragmatic way to get, get at it. Um, 
just for the fun of it, you don't have to look at this if you don't want, but this shows you the people um, we ask questions to. So this is where our own evidence comes from. Really a huge number of uh, uh, different domains and, and um, this sort of tells us. And really important things, you know, the things that are important to computer scientists and archeologists are really different uh, in some ways and in, in other ways they're similar and that's been a really fun, fun thing to find out. Anyway, you don't have to read all this. Okay, so um, the last thing I'm going to do is just go weird on you, um, unless you think I've gone weird on you already, uh, which may be the case, um, which is something I've been thinking about a lot. So, you know, what keeps, up, what keeps Fran up at like 2 in the morning, uh, in addition to all the other things that keep uh, Fran up at 2 in the morning, which is the Internet of Things. So, this is like the great new you know, buzzwords, self-driving cars, refrigerators that are talking to your toasters that are talking to your grocery store, you know, the whole, you know, world of interconnected, you know, wonderful everything. And, um, and so the question is, you know, who, what kind of governance structure are we going to have there? We think about the data ecosystem. All of this is data. This is the brave new world of data. And so you think about this big interconnected environment, and then you think, well, what are the rules in this environment? You know, are we going to have this amazingly enabling environment where, you know, my refrigerator tells the grocery store, Fran needs milk, milk shows up, no worries, I don't have to, like, you know, busy my, myself thinking about it. Or are we going to have some kind of crazy Lord of the Flies where people are intruding all the time or um, your environment uh, uh, is just sort of up for grabs? And, and you can kind of add, you know, this is like hell, right, uh, from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, and you can ask the following questions, you know, who's accountable when your self-driving car hits someone? So, you know, there have been accidents with self-driving cars. It's often um, uh, not just a malfunction, but there may be ethical issues. You know, like, do I, do I hit this person or do I hit that, that, that person? Two bad choices, right? What do I do? Um, which decisions should be made by technology? If, you know, I go to the grocery store and, you know, I buy a lot of wine and cookies and my grocery store tells my insurance company, you know, France at risk for alcoholism or obes obesity and my rates go up, right? Was I part of that loop? So, you know, okay, a little, a little out there. But, um, but there are decisions being made by technology all the time. When does your privacy matter more than the needs of others? You know, we're all kind of okay with, you know, going through the airport lines and they ask us a lot of questions about where we were and, you know, those are sort of maybe public health things. When does it get too intrusive? Um, and, you know, your computer, your computer is technology. It does not know good from evil. You know, how do I give my computer ethics because it's going to be making decisions on my behalf? So there's a whole governance of social infrastructure component for the Internet of Things that we just really, all over the world, haven't the faintest clue how to deal with. And there's a lot of ideas and, you know, um, uh, really great discussions, but this is like the brave new world for us. And if we don't get our heads around this now and, you know, moving into it, when this technology is really ubiquitous, um, we're going to need, you playing catch up is going to be really hard. So. Um, so, you know, where do we want to go? So, you know, one way to start is Isaac Asimov. Uh, he introduced over 50 years ago the social rules for robots. Uh, robot may not, you know, harm humanity, you know, has to be, uh, does the robot thing, you know, unless it hurts people, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, so really, really cool thing to think about, and maybe this governs uh, the behavior of robots pretty well. How do we apply this kind of a thing to the Internet of Things? And how do you make that specific so you know what to do uh, when your self-driving car uh, hits someone? So, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about is, well, what would governance mean for the Internet of Things? And, um, and so, you know, back to the UN, um, the UN has thought about governance in countries all over the world. Obviously, we don't all govern in exactly the same way, but we all think about sort of similar themes, you know, peace and security and you know, uh, rule of law and human rights and sustainable development, things like that. So what kinds of laws will we need? And, um, you know, one thing to think about is when you think about peace and security, you know, we really are going to have to get on top of Internet security, you know, trust, safety, crime, 
Um, you know, it's, it, we're really going to have to, um, as we all know anyway, um, really step it up to deal with an Internet of Things kind of environment. Um, we need to have a way of figuring out what appropriate and inappropriate behavior on the, on the Internet of Things is. You know, what's appropriate behavior for me? What's appropriate behavior for my toaster, right? There's lots of entities in the Internet of Things. Um, we have to figure out, you know, do people rank over toasters in the Internet of Things? I would be, I would be for that one. Um, but, but in some sense, I mean, it, there will be a lot of different kinds of entities. Um, right now, you can, um, in most cases, opt out of the Internet, right? It's hard to do. But will you be able to opt out of the Internet of Things? And, and you know, potentially no. Potentially, when all of these things are sort of interconnected, you walk across the street in a place for surveillance, um, or you try to do something, you won't be able to opt out. What does that mean in terms of your privacy, intrusion, um, uh, rights, et cetera? Sustainable development, you know, how are we going to develop this? So safety and security and privacy and all of these issues, ethics that are important to people, uh, matter. And, you know, in the end of the day, technology is a vehicle, and it's a vehicle for actualization of us as human beings and as our societies. How do we make sure, rather than being the focus, it becomes an actualizing, enabling issue? And as I said, you know, this is something that, you know, you see sort of pockets of institutes looking at various different legal frameworks, um, like the uh, transportation industry is looking very seriously at sort of laws um, to do with autonomous vehicles, et cetera. But for the most part, we really don't know how this is going to go, and it's really important to start thinking about this now. Um, future work is like, okay, once we get that figured out, um, you know, there's all kinds of sort of interesting questions you can ask about the Internet of Things. If, if the citizens are anything from, you know, my iPhone to my toaster to myself to my university to my company to my country, um, you know, how am I going to manage all of that? What's the ethnography of all of those citizens? What's the anthropology of the Internet of Things? Um, what should the ethical codes be? If there are ethical modules that we put in technology, whose ethics should they be? How, are we, how do we decide that? And, you know, I mean, what are the procedures? Do we vote? Do we, you know, um, and who gets those votes. So these are all, you know, some of the things that I've been reading and, uh, you know, no doubt some of you are reading as well, but um, they're big questions for us. But if we really want to get a handle on the data ecosystem, this is where it's going. And it's a really important thing to start thinking about in a, a really serious way. Okay. So um, uh, to close, um, uh, you know, I just want to say uh, the point that I wanted to make is it's not just cool technology. You know, it's not just, you know, do I have enough storage to host my data? It really is an interlocking um, sense of all of these different really important drivers for the data ecosystem. And we just look at one of them at our own risk because really we need a lot of different players. And so, um, so I, I read a book a few years ago uh, called Switch. And what I loved about this book is um, it talked about how you create change. So say all of us want to go out there and make the data world a great place to be. You know, what do we do on Monday morning? And, you know, it's, it's pretty clear we're not going to be, like, writing the, you know, um, the critical report on the Internet of Things that everyone goes and adopts. So what are we going to do? So, so I just want to give you my Monday morning list that all of us can do. So here's my Monday morning list of small steps that each of us could do. Um, first of all, for all of our projects, um, we could create a data management plan. You know, let your data be a first-class citizen, create a plan to manage it, and create a plan for stewarding it, and make your data available to, you know, whoever you can. And, uh, you know, that often means, you know, put it someplace they can find it. Put it in a repository or a university uh, library or someplace where um, it, it's really going to get the maximum out of it. Um, economics. You can budget realistically for your data. You can assume it is not free and really sort of figure out what the data bill is going to be. Try to do that in a, in a realistic way and then prioritize that. And I know that um, as PI of many projects throughout my career, it's really hard to give money towards anything but, you know, the stuff that you want to do work on. But there is an infrastructure environment that's got to be part of it. Um, culture in your communities. 
Um, you can talk about whether data sharing is relevant for you or not, and if it is, you can really think about creating um, policies that help people do that. Um, you should cite and publish your data. Data publications are really important. And um, a, lot of, um, uh, uh, a lot of periodicals are starting to put that in. If you have a conference that you help organize, you could create a data session. There's a way of getting a data publication. Just have the, you know, the marine biology uh, conference, there's a data session in that, and then you, know, then you have some marine biology. It could be peer reviewed and, uh, and all of that. And then politics, um, we're always making the case to stakeholders. A really good thing for us to remember is that our stakeholders are making the case to their stakeholders. So you have to give them an argument they can use and not just this is really important to Fran, this is like a bad argument to use. Um, so it has to be something that they can, you know, go to their next realm and say, you know, this is important. It drives innovation or it creates jobs or it does whatever the kinds of metrics of success are. Um, and then we can do our best to, you know, spread the word and create and adopt and support policy and practice that, that helps us um, do better jobs as data stewards um, to preserve our data, to create our infrastructure so we can um, go towards the innovation that, um, that we really want to see in uh, a data-driven world. So with that, I thank you.